My name is Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program at New America, and I just want to welcome all of you to this uh, to this webinar about uh, Black voters in the 2024 election. We're really excited to host this. One of the things we've done over the last few before the election and since is really take a look at at particular groups that often get just a single label on the you know reporting from the exit polls. So we did an extensive report about Latino voters before the election. We have a colleague who who's been doing a lot of work on uh, young men and the radicalization of young men and their relationship to the, the election, which is an important topic. But uh, we're very, very fortunate to have Ted Johnson uh, at New America, who's been studying Black voters for, for quite a long time uh, and joined New America as a national fellow uh, almost a decade ago, was a fellow in the political reform program, and has come back to New America to as a senior advisor to the leadership of the organization and also as the head of our uh, of our uh, America at 250 project, which is thinking about ways to uh, really have a deeper understanding of America as we go into the 250th anniversary. So I'm excited to hear all this. I'm just going to turn it over to Ted, and he has a great panel, which which he'll introduce. So thank you all for joining us. Yeah, and thank you, Mark. Thank you all for being here. Um, this, this is going to be fun. I've, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, so we're going to talk all things Black voters, 2024 election, and then sort of what next steps look like. And I'm thrilled to be joined by two of my favorite people. Certainly when it comes to reading Black voters, I'm always looking for their bylines or or they're on TV. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Leah wright Rigger. She is an associate professor at Johns Hopkins SNF Agora Institute and a political contributor at CNN. And Maya King, who is a political reporter at the New York Times, where she covers the Southeast and is based in Atlanta. I know y'all have been super busy pre-election, through the election, and now. So thank you so much for joining and to, uh, to have this conversation. Thanks for being here. Uh, so look, I figured what I do is try to set the scene a little bit, and then I just want to learn from, from y'all. So every election season, we know <laughs> two things are going to happen. One, folks are going to believe that Black folks are just going to vote for whoever the Democratic nominee is, and, and that's been the case for a while. And two, that campaigns are going to make pitches, whether earnest or not, to Black voters, and they're going to go to the churches and the barbershops and try to find where Black people congregate as a way of showing how their campaign or their policy agenda might uh, help Black Americans do better. Um, but you know, for me, it's it's I think one of the uh, distinct things about American politics, certainly in the last century, is black voting behavior. There's just not been another group of people as large as the black electorate is that has voted so uniformly for so long, so consistently, even as the parties have shifted um, over time. And uh, there's a lot of theories for what that is and for why that is. And we can talk about some of that uh, through the course of this of the uh, of this conversation. But the, the the fact that since really the 60s, upwards of about 90% of black folks are voting for president, the Democratic presidential nominee or the Republican one um, is significant. It's very significant, uh, even more so that when Barack Obama ran for president in 2008 and 2012, upwards of 95% of black voters supported his candidacy. And then since the end of his presidency in 2016, 2020, and again in 2024, we've seen black voters, the, the uniformity we saw under the Obama presidency began to change back to levels that existed before Obama came on the scene. And the fact that that has happened while Donald Trump has been the standard bearer for the Republican Party uh, brings up a lot of questions about what does black Republicanism look like anymore? What is black conservatism? Um, is that different from what it means to be black in a MAGA Republican Party? And uh, why is it that Trump is has been able to do better with black voters than folks like John McCain and Mitt Romney, um, and even folks potentially like George the George Bushes, uh, both the first and, and the second one, maybe is as good as Reagan in 80. So those are the kinds of things that uh, that's sort of what leads us to the summer of 2024 and what we'll unpack over the next uh, half hour or so before we turn the questions from the audience. So enough of me. I, I want to get to both of you and hear what you were thinking in, say, August, September, October of this year before the election and the conversation around Black voters and, and how, how you we're thinking about the election at that point in time. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Leah. August, September, October, what was your sense of the Black electorate and what, what might happen next? 
Sure. So if you remember August and September really coming off of the Democratic National Convention, uh, I was there as, as part of a media, uh, media coverage, but also for a research project, a larger research project. And one of the things that was palatable was, was the excitement. And I really think it's true. You know, right before the convention, Kamala Harris gets a bounce in the national polls. Uh, she also gets a small, a slight bounce immediately following the Democratic National Convention. And there is clear excitement and momentum around her, particularly amongst Black women. Uh, you know, after the moment after she becomes the presumptive nominee, uh, what is it, uh, close to 90,000 Black women end up on a Zoom call and raise millions of dollars. A couple of days later, Black men do the exact same thing with a, a significant amount of turnout. So we see this kind of energy that is that is really behind her. But the thought that I had was, was twofold. Um, one, even as we're seeing this real energy, um, there comes a point where you know the momentum is gonna to start to wane. And that happens towards the end of S September. Um, and one of the clear differences between 2020 and 2024 is that the groups that really propelled Joe Biden into the White House, these kind of uh, you know, fair fight, uh, the uh, certain dimensions of Southern uh, Urban League and national uh, NAACP organizations, uh, the New Georgia Voter, Voter Project, even the larger movement for Black Lives, which had transformed itself in 2020 into a voter registration drive, those things aren't materializing in the same way that they did in 2020. So that gives me immediate pause. The second thing that happens, though, is for a very long time, predating 2024, there has been a very small segment of Black male voters that have been expressing their discontent towards their relationship with the Democratic Party. It's come out in polling, it's come out in survey, quantitative and qualitative interviews. Uh, there has been kind of a, a, a larger trend downwards um, that again, the majority of black men are going to vote for the Democratic camp, uh, nominee, but there was the subsection that was being very vocal about their dissatisfaction with their relationship with the party. And that subsection became louder, became significantly louder in the lead up to the 2020 election, 2024 election. And it's not to say that I thought that group was gonna go out and wholeheartedly vote for Donald Trump. And I've written about this before pretty, pretty extensively, but that also given that this was an election that was really gonna be about turnout and at the margins, what did that mean for this enthusiasm for Kamala Harris as the nominee? Would there be enough enthusiasm to sustain her uh, in a way that would catapult her to the um, catapult her to the White House. And for me, some of the stuff that I was seeing in battleground states, particularly Pennsylvania and Michigan, indicated that that, that enthusiasm was just not there in, in ways that could that were win uh, were winnable or would result in a, in a victory for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mike? Were you seeing the same thing? I, I've read a lot of your reporting out of Georgia um, it's around men, black voters in general, churches, the, the sort of social fabric there. What were what were you seeing? Yeah, I think, um, Dr. Rigger, you kind of hit the nail right on the head. Um, immediately after the DNC, we saw this real surge in energy, particularly among black voters, and it showed up in a really um, meaningful way in the Deep South states that Democrats had kind of written off when President Biden was atop the Democratic ticket, like Georgia and North Carolina, were now suddenly very much in play. And I was hearing from a lot of organizers on the ground that they really felt like they had a lot of work to do, but that it was doable um, to hold Georgia and to build on their gains, possibly. And then they saw an opening to flip North Carolina. But um, but to your earlier point, you know, there really wasn't a lot of infrastructure and real funding there to make that happen. I think what we saw in Georgia in 2020 was not necessarily an outlier with the victories of Biden, Warnock and Ossoff. But I mean, there was a lot of money and, and manpower that went into that that we just mm -hmm. really weren't seeing happen on the ground. And another thing, you know, was Democrats having to um, really... Democrats were giving a lot of voice to their understanding that Black voters in 2024 were to be treated like a persuasion voting bloc, that they could not, the assumption could no longer be that Black voters will just turn out en masse for um, any Democrat. I think that was really brought into stark relief when we saw Biden's numbers start to plummet among Black voters. 
But I think there was this false assumption that with Harris's ascendance, her being a Black and South Asian woman, her being a product of an HBCU, a member of a Black sorority, that um, they didn't have to do as much work then to persuade Black voters to turn out. Uh, Black men were kind of the canary in the coal mine. I definitely saw that in Georgia. Um, a lot of Black men were telling me, I don't know why Democrats are assuming that they have my vote. I don't know why either party is assuming that I will vote. Um, and then the question very quickly became not necessarily will Black voters support Democrats or Republicans, but will Black voters, as you point out too, Dr. Rigurd, stand out uh, at the margins and will they stay home? Um, and I think that's kind of what we saw that made the difference between a Democrat's wins and, well, really Harris's wins and losses uh, in these deep South states. Okay, so so we're leading up to the election. I know I was hearing black men are leaking from the Democratic Party at maybe alarming rates, so much so that Harris put together a plan for black men of, of how her opportunity economy would, would help black folks. Trump was sort of re rehashing his best hits of how to help black you know, men um, and, and bringing out his celebrity and athlete, athletic friends uh, to sort of uh, to, to be persuasive or even point to his mugshot as a way of suggesting that that put him in solidarity with uh with black men in particular um so uh, Leah so you've written like the definitive work on on like black republicanism certainly in the in the 20th century what what about black people especially black men in the Republican Party from the 20th century can help us understand why Trump was the figure that is uh that seemed to be to have more success with black voters than uh than you know the previous uh, set of Republican nominees. Sure. So I, I think there are a couple of things that are happening here. One is that we have to look at the 2008 to 2016 period as an outlier. You have a black man on the ticket and you have a black man at the top of the ticket for the first time ever. Um, it is groundbreaking. I think we can all talk about these anecdotal stories of people saying, you know, maybe I was a Republican, but I want to be I want to be part of history. I want to vote for for Barack Obama. And yeah. so we should actually look at those numbers as outliers. That's what we should look at as radically different. The second thing is that the majority, I think the more majority of people look at Trump and they say, here's a man who is just openly xenophobic, bigoted, racist, you know, all of these things. And they hammer it over and over and over again to the point that the majority of, of black voters, you know, when, when, uh, when asked about it, say, yes, I know Donald Trump is racist, or yes, I believe Donald Trump to be racist. But what we don't understand, and I think this is, has a long thread, is that for a certain subsection of Black voters that are, uh, that are disproportionately made up of Black men, that doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because they perceive the larger system to be racist in and of itself. So what does it mean that Donald Trump is racist when you also perceive Joe Biden to be racist? And we often heard things about hey, well, Biden is racist, look at him and, and Robert Byrd, right, Senator, uh, uh, deceased Senator Robert Byrd, or look at what happened with Anita Hill. That was a constant that came up over and over and over again. So there's not a lot of nuance to it, but it fits this kind of larger perception of, well, both parties, the two-party system is rigged, it's racist, it's, it's out to get us. The other thing that we see is that this group of, I think, Black men, um, tend to be deeply transactional and transactional in a sense of we want something for our vote. And I think that's an important thing to explore because we see all of these other demographics and groups with the exception of really black voters say we want something for our vote. Politics in this country in the United States is deeply transactional. So when we say, oh, black men are transactional or this cross section of black voters are transactional, we often put a moral overtone on it where we say, oh, why would they be transactional? They're transactional because politics is transactional. And what they're asking for is for the Democratic Party to put their money where their mouths are. Do something. Show us something. The last thing that I'll say here, too, is that even as, you know, when we look in the 20th century, part of what uh, these 20th century voting patterns, particularly amongst this like cross-section of Black men, we see the areas where, where the Republican Party has done better has been spaces where one, these black voters are disillusioned with the Democratic Party, but then also where they see what they what appears to be an insurgent Republican character. 
And it doesn't necessarily matter if Black people believe that that character is racist or not, but they believe that they will be transactional in a way that benefits them. So it is still about the larger collective, but it's also what can I get from the collective? And I think one of the things that we missed about the 2024 election that history really is a, a really important guide to is that over and over again, these depressed areas were saying, we are not feeling the impact of democratic policies. We are not seeing the yeah. impact of democratic policies. We've grown up with a black president. That's not unique. That's not special to us. We also have grown up with Trump in our orbit. So now, yeah, he says racist stuff all the time, but who doesn't say racist stuff all the time? This is what everybody does. And so then, the thing that they missed is that we began to see, particularly in these kind of micro-targeted approaches by Republicans, very transactional politics. Mm -hmm. We will do this. And I think Maya's point about being the canary in the coal mine was well taken. You know, you have a figure like Ice Cube say it explicitly. Donald Trump is sitting at the table and he's going to give us this in exchange for our vote. Yeah. It is pure, I mean, that is as transactional, right? Quid pro quo, it is about as transactional as you can get. And I'll add to, to that, to that really good point is that, you know, Republicans, for whatever it's worth, did have a handful of people who kind of served as validators or um, envoys to this group of Black men. I think Democrats really struggled to find figures and surrogates who could really speak to this exact issue. Um, you know, a lot of sources and even friends of mine reached out to me after President Obama's uh, conversation with Black men in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. not saying that, you know, this was just a total miss by the former president, but it did not land with the voters they were trying to reach in the way that Democrats intended, where I think uh, President Obama was trying to really have like this tough conversation with weeks until the election, the strategy had obviously shifted from, you know, the carrot to the stick, which was, we're going to start talking to you and giving you these policy promises and really make you feel empowered to vote to, okay, but we really need you to turn out and we really need you to vote for Harris. Um, and the suggestion that this was coming from a, that Black men's questions about uh, supporting the Democratic ticket were coming from, you know, a place of of transactional politics or, you know, that this was really, they really just had concerns. Uh, the suggestion that this was coming from a place instead of sexism um, or mm -hmm. misinformation, I think was insulting to, to this group of Black men um, and may very well have contributed to their decision to stay home. And another thing I'll say too, is that, you know, it's so interesting to think back on the impact that Obama's presidency had, that he did have a number of Black Republicans uh, coming forth to support him. Harris didn't really have that. You know, that was one question that I was wondering was, of course, Colin Powell is now deceased, but where were the, the sort of Black conservatives who may have felt aligned um, with, with people like Liz Cheney? Like there really wasn't the the same permission structure in place for those folks to feel comfortable enough uh, to come forward, at least in a way that we were able to catch in the media. And that's really interesting. I hadn't considered that like there was no black conservative spokesperson vouching for Harris in the way that that Obama had. Um, and in fact, a lot right. of the most prominent ones sort of doubled down. It seemed like on on the MAGA philosophy. But Leo, I'm sorry you. So one of the things that, uh, to, to Maya's point, you know, the, the very prominent Black Republicans, I think, who were outspoken during the campaign cycle had been outspokenly uh, anti-Trump for a long time. And so they were seen as either part of the media establishment mm. or they were seen as, you know, turncoats or essentially rhinos. so, you know, rhinos. And, right. and um, I think, you know, we see somebody like Michael Steele, who Michael Steele has been very vocal, was very vocal about his support for Kamala Harris, but it's also true that Michael Steele has been ardently anti-Trump for a long time. So these, these, I think many of the re the Black Republicans who were anti-Trump, who came out and spoke in behalf of Harris, had already been pushed out of that space. The other thing that I'll bring up is that I, I don't necessarily know that they're in. We're still waiting for for returns to come out, financial returns to see how much Republicans and Democrats spent on Black outreach. But one of the things that I think a lot of people missed is that 
in the aftermath of Trump lo uh, losing in 2020, um, the Republican Party put a lot of effort into having uh, Black spokespeople very quietly engage in outreach efforts that wasn't necessarily explicitly Republican and pro-Trump, but it would just so happen that the people endorsing it were deeply Trump, but they were also authentically connected to these communities. So the one that I'm thinking of that completely, everyone missed this, this was not on anyone's radar, right, was one of the co-founders of Death Row Records, right? No, like, that's not something that people were, were talking about. Um, but here he is, he's been ever since Trump pardoned him in the closing days of the Trump administration in 2020, this man has been going to black communities and having weekly and monthly sessions about economic opportunity and economic freedom, and then saying, and I think Trump is the person to do that. People completely miss that. And I think they also miss what kind of incremental impact that can have, as opposed to say, everyone focusing on Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker is not gonna convince any black, you know, any black man to go out and vote for Donald Trump. But the founder of Death Row Records, having four years worth of, of quiet outreach in battleground states around economic opportunity, that it might actually do something. And that's the margins game that the Republicans right. were playing. And that was successful, I would say, um, by the time we got to election night. Um, and I think that Democrats also, and even reporters really missed the, really missed that because it was hard to straddle or to, to hold in one hand, okay, Harris might be earning, you know, she, her support with black voters may be slipping, but slipping meaning she's still getting 85 to 90% of the black vote. And Republicans are also making a play for those voters who might feel disillusioned or misplaced in the Democratic Party. I think both of those things were happening at the same time. Right. So, okay. So now we get to election night and to sort of do the walk, I know we're still waiting on like the super good numbers from Pew, which may take a, a few more months to come out, but it looks like the last exits I saw were uh, Trump at about 13% of, of, uh, of black voters. Um, and so if we, you know, back to 2008, I think Obama wins 96% of black voters to McCain's four. And then we get to 2012 and it's like Obama's 94% of black voters to Romney's six and 2016, Hillary Clinton gets 93, 94 percent of black voters to Trump six or seven. And then Trump gets about eight or nine percent of black voters in 2020. And um, and now we're at 13. So a steady trend uh, upwards over the last 20 years. So, OK, election night, Trump gets basically one one in seven black voters. Um, what from election night do you take away from both how black voters, the choices they made and how they received the results and black voters in relation to how white Americans voted, Hispanic, Latino folks voted? So sort of a two part question there. Would you would you learn from about black voters on election night? And then would you learn about black voters in the context of other races and ethnicities? And I'll start with you first this time, Maya. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that I took away from this, particularly in Atlanta, was just that demographics is not necessarily destiny, that, mm -hmm. that Democrats put a lot of stock in just high turnout from um, across the state, and a large enough portion of that being Black voters automatically meaning that they were going to win. I mean, they were very confident heading into election night that they would be successful just looking at those turnout numbers. And I think they realized that that was a flawed um, belief system and that their strategy, again, of treating Black voters as persuasion targets was kind of too little too late. That really didn't start to happen until the final days of the race, uh, or excuse me, final weeks, I'll say. Um, and then, you know, now a few weeks removed, um, I'm still kind of think like poking through the numbers and trying to make sense of them. Um, it does seem that Harris did lose a, a considerable number of black voters to the couch that they didn't decide to vote for Republicans, but that they did stay home. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that reflects, you know, challenges again in messaging um, to black voters. And a lot of the reporting that I did, though, in the immediate you know, hours and days after 
uh, the election result was really on how Black voters who did vote and who did organize were feeling, particularly Black women. Um, for them, this was a very significant race. This was an Obama moment for many Black women mm -hmm. Democrats who felt like they were being rewarded for a lot of their work and their contributions to the Democratic Party um, and felt let down not only by the party, but really by their fellow Americans. And so mm -hmm. I think what we're also seeing now um, on top of everything that we've said is Black voters, Black Democrats sort of trying to make sense of their place in the party and, and in the political system. Mm. What about you, Leah? What, was, what were your big takeaways? So there were a lot of big takeaways. And I think the first one, the, the first, the, the biggest one was it felt like a repudiation to the Democratic Party. That this mm -hmm. is more about the Democratic Party and less about Donald Trump, some sweeping decisive, you know, insightful strategy that he had done to generate, you know, uh, increased Black turnout, that in fact, we see this kind of uh, widespread, you know, uh, widespread shifting that's not just about Black voters, but is also about Latino voters, is also about Asian voters, is also about a certain segment of white non-college educated voters, and so on and so on. So part of what it what it tells me is that you know, in the gap between 2020 and 2020, 2024, that where uh, Democrats thought that they had a mandate after the 2020 election, that in fact, voters had expectations of them to do more. So when we heard people on the ground saying over the last four years, I am incredibly frustrated by X, they were being very honest about their feelings about that. And I think for with regard to Black voters, they were being very transparent about their frustrations with various elements of the Democratic Party. This is one of the reasons why we, you know, during this election cycle, the, the whole notion was we actually have to treat Black voters as swing voters this time around or a contestable category, not because the two parties are competing for them, but because Black voters are very clear that they may not actually come out in sizable numbers, or that some of them may go to third party or may even vote for Republicans this time around. Um, the other thing, though, and I think this is going to feel this is going to feel a little bit paradoxical because on paper, on raw paper, Trump in some areas did better than with with black voters that the numbers than we've seen since really like 1980 or 1976. But one of the things I tell people is that anything that falls within the margin of roughly 18% or below is within the mean of what Republicans have gotten from Black voters in presidential elections since 1964. The problem is that we continue to look at Barack Obama as something like the standard, when in fact, he is a complete anomaly and that the, the entire context around Black voting patterns has changed in the way that we understand Black voters and the way that Black voters understand themselves has also changed. And so when we look at these, you know, when we look at, say, uh, 13, 14 percent, that's actually equivalent to what Ronald Reagan gets in mm. 1980, right? And Ronald Reagan Black voters unequivocally are like, that man is racist, <laughs> right? <They're, laughs> they, have, they have no question about this. When when um, Muhammad Ali endorses Ronald Reagan in 1984, right, uh, Coretta Scott King says, I think he's taken one too many punches to the head, right? Because yeah. she can't explain it. But it's part of this larger trend of all of these people, all of these Black voters saying, I know that many people think that Ronald Reagan is racist, but I, you know, I'm voting for the dude. I'm I'm voting for the guy. We see this again in 2004 with George W. Bush, right? Yeah. And to the point of like strategists and outreach, that one you have to point to Armstrong Williams. Armstrong Williams does yeoman's work, and Colin Powell does yeoman's work in order to get black voters over. And we see numbers that rival the numbers that we see amongst black men uh, across uh, across some of these places. So I, I think that's important to point out. But the last thing I want to highlight though is that. The most interesting data, even as this data looks historically very similar to what we've seen before, the most interesting spaces are those places where Republicans effectively, like in some cases, doubled the amount of support that they were getting. And it's not necessarily from the demographic that we would expect. We would expect it to be, say, upper middle class uh, or wealthy African-American men, African-American men making over a certain amount of money. But instead, like in places like Philadelphia, it's coming from a different demographic. So once those, those final data points are out, 
I, I think what we're going to see is that there is a shift in the kind of makeup of Black people who are willing to vote Republican, so that they're looking very different from their you know, 1980s or 1990s or 2000 counterparts. That's the part that's really interesting and that we should pay, we be paying very close attention to. The yeah, yeah, like these aren't your father's black Republicans, right? I, I want right. to ask you about this, Maya, um, because again, the exit polling is still, you know, it is what it is, so it's not super reliable, but it points to, to something to trends, perhaps, or something to pay attention to. I saw in Georgia that 16% of black men voted for Trump, 10% of black women did. And in Philadelphia, 26% of black men voted for Trump and 2% of black women did. So there was even the gender cap gap across regions was different. And I'm curious if you saw um, other distinctions, like were, were the folks you, you talked to or reported on in Georgia and the Southeast, were they younger folks that were more willing to break from the Democratic Party, or were they sort of older traditional conservatives? Like, who was the 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 typical Black Trump voter in in the Southeast? Um, those numbers are shocking. I did not know yes. that out of Philadelphia. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's bananas in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I I spent some time in Philly when Biden was still atop the ticket before the um, the presidential debate that sort of changed everything. And I mean, it was pretty abysmal then. But I did not realize that that trend might have continued. Um, you know, I've, I I learned this year in sort of covering demographics that in party jargon, a young voter is like someone under fifty. Um, so there might I'm be, Gen X, like, we ain't young no yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I was thinking like the 18 to, to 25 group, but mm. those are, those can be an unreliable bunch. Um, but really the young black voters that Democrats were going for were actually like the 35 to 50 year old black men that they were hearing from who they felt were, uh, were, were Trump curious or might've stayed home. Um, I think about one, one day I spent at invest fest here in Atlanta, which is a big sort of convention hosted by the host yes. of a popular podcast called earn your leisure. Um, these are two young black men who have actually spent quite a bit of time with the vice president and uh, are really just have a captive audience of millions of largely black men under 50 who are entrepreneurs who are thinking about the economy who are thinking about ways to make money so i was like well let me go and mm -hmm. see who these people are going to vote for um and you know these were a lot of trump curious black men a lot of black men um one who i spoke to in particular was a lifelong democrat came from a family of black Democrats, had his mother and his wife constantly nudging him to vote and was like, I'm going to write my mom's name in this year. Um, and that was not, be and that was because he didn't feel like he could stomach a vote for Trump, but did not hear enough, he said, from Harris or the Democrats um, to improve his life or that of his family. This is like an upwardly mobile entrepreneurial, I think he was 44, 45 year old black man in Atlanta. This is the exact kind of voter that Democrats and Republicans really, really, really needed. Um, and ultimately, you know, he he kind of he just wrote in his 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 mom's name. But what was interesting about that conversation to me was one, his friend who was his age was like, look, I'm really not sure if either of these people are going to do anything for me. But I feel like, you know, this talk of fascism and authoritarianism is probably really bad for Black folks. So I'm going to vote for Harris. So there was also the sort of survival vote thing. But that was not that was still a warning sign to me because that was not enthusiasm. That was being pragmatic. And what Harris needed in a state like Georgia was enthusiasm, was for was I mean, they needed to be at InvestFest, honestly. They needed to be talking more to, to the guys like um, like the Earn Your Leisure hosts. Um, but it was it was a really fascinating exercise in sort of understanding what was motivating a lot of these voters. And then if you go deeper into South Georgia um, and start to bring, you know, real class concerns and economic concerns into the picture, mm -hmm. it's just a totally different picture. And there were a lot of black voters um, in South and Central Georgia who, um, again, were being talked to at the margins who were absolutely open to Trump. And so I really think the lesson from this election that I learned here in Georgia and just in the South was that a larger deciding factor now for people's willingness to vote and who they would vote for was not necessarily their race. 
So the ties to the Democratic Party that Black voters may have felt very deeply um, as the party that has delivered for them in the past, as the party that has given voice uh, to racial justice and to real issues impacting Black voters, that connection has largely been severed. Uh, just mm -hmm. by generational ties and just by cultural changes. And now education and, cl and class are really the two deciding factors, I think, and they kind of go hand in hand. You know, how much money are you making and are you college educated, I think is a larger indicator of someone's willingness to vote uh, or support Democrats or Republicans than than their racial identity. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's the part that I find most fascinating because I, you know, I mean, I, I, Leah was one of my advisors and for my, my doctoral work and, uh, you know, linked fate was the thing I was talked uh, lots about and trying to explore the extent to which black people's group identity shapes their electoral behavior or their political behavior um, to sort of advance the interests of the group as, a, as the best way of advancing interests that would help them. So, Leah, do you do you buy the argument that maybe there's a political realignment happening um, and perhaps uh, black folks' racial identity will factor lower in, in the party alignment piece. I don't know. I feel like a realignment is happening. I just don't know if it includes black folks. And I'm curious if, uh, if, if that's your sense of it too. So I think that there is a soft realignment happening. And mm -hmm. I say soft because I don't necessarily know it is, if it is survivable without Donald Trump. Um, and I don't know if it is a long lasting kind of realignment. I think it's a shaky realignment. Um, and it's one, uh, to Maya's point, that is largely dependent upon questions of class broadly const uh, uh, constrained, um, but also, you know, education factors. But then there's an area I think that we are not, there are two areas that I don't know that we're giving enough attention to as we think about this potential soft realignment. Um, one, I think that the, a lot of the soft realignment is around grievance politics and that there is a kind of multiracial, multi-ethnic grievance politics that has emerged under Trump that allows people to articulate their frustrations and feel validated in turn, although there are very rarely concrete or structural solutions, like solutions that will actually solve the underlying problems. And so I'll just use an example of this. You know, we saw there's been a lot of uh, reporting that's coming out of New York City looking at uh, Latino immigrants uh, in New York City, particularly in uh, AOC's district, um, who have completely, you know, essentially voted for AOC, but also voted for Donald Trump. And many of them talked about the actual on the ground experience of living in these communities. And it is it is way too easy to say, well, now, you know, these are people who are immigrants who now that they've climbed up the ladder, they're kicking it over. But instead of what we heard was things like, well, when we brought in, when there were new migrants, because there were no jobs for the new migrants, we saw a lot of them emerge as street walkers. And then we saw a lot of pimps emerge. And so now there are women in these dangerous situations, there's violence, there's all of these things that are affecting our community and, trans and, uh, and uh, changing them. And while we have a leader in our district who is addressing this and is fighting for us and is authentic, we're not seeing that on a national level. We feel like that's not happening, right? So instead, what do they have? They have someone who voices their grievances. Oh yeah, it's the migrants, right? Or it's the immigrants. It's they're taking our jobs. They're bringing in crime and all of these and all of these things. While on the local level, there's actually a politician who is fighting for them and understanding the structural problems that are causing the issue. Um, the other thing that I'll say here too is that I think their theories, as the numbers come out, it's looking increasingly like uh, for Black voters, the the people that defect or move into the Trump camp are younger, they're uh, uh, millennials, they're a couple of Gen Xs, um, they're Gen Zs, right? So this kind of big gap. And one of the things that we know about them is that they don't trust traditional media sources. So they already don't trust political institutions and to some extent with good reason. Look what happens with George Floyd. Part of the reason protests erupt, erupts around George Floyd is absolute distrust or mistrust in political institutions because political institutions have habitually hailed black, failed black people. So we already have a distrust in the American two-party system, but now we also have a distrust in traditional uh, news media. And we see people increasingly looking towards YouTube, Instagram, uh, older people are looking towards Facebook, but Twitch, right? 
their favorite gamers, their streamers are talking about political news, right? There's a reason why Kamala Harris goes on the Up and Smoke tour, I mean, the Up and Smoke podcast, um, because she is trying to reach a demographic that is just not tuned into legacy media, mainstream media, or traditional media sources. But one of the things that we miss in all of this is the way that these things have served as radicalizing, these alternative medias have served as radicalizing spaces that amplify grievances without offering solutions, but then also that become gateways for moving into conservative politics. So I'll give you an example. All of the streamers, all of the Twitchers, you know, all of the black streamers, black Twitchers, all of these podcasters, particularly men, are talking about crypto. They're talking about cryptocurrency. And there are all of these conferences all over the United States with hundreds of thousands of participants. Who are the fastest growing users of cryptocurrency or purchasers of cryptocurrency? It is black people, it is black community. And so this becomes a space as they're going to these conferences, who are the headliners? Donald Trump, right? There's one in Nashville that's massive, Donald Trump. There's one in Arizona, the Trump uh, uh, family are the keynote speakers. Republicans are in these spaces, Democrats are not. And so it becomes a gateway for those people who are either disenchanted with the two party system or who are Trump curious, but it becomes a way for them to have these conversations, to air these grievances in spaces that we don't even, we haven't even imagined yeah. as political spaces. Um, and the last thing that I'll say here too, is that I don't wanna uh, overstate the racism and sexism component of this election cycle. I do think that that is important, but I think it's missing some of the nuances that perhaps go into the question of the relationship between black men and black women and questions of authenticity or feeling protective of supportive of certain kinds of black people. And I think when you mix that in with the distrust of political institutions, of the American two-party system, and then you add in a veneer of masculinity that is suspicious of certain kinds of black women, you get a recipe for a cross section of black voters who look at Kamala Harris and they say, I cannot trust you. And I don't feel protective over you. The bulk of black people do feel that way, but you still have a significant portion especially those that have been radicalized in these grievance polit political spaces who say, I'm looking at you and I cannot trust you. And that comes out over and over again when you talk to a certain cross-section of, of black, the Black electorate. And this makes me think of how much ground Democrats have really ceded in the media, to your point, Dr. Agur, about how uh, Republicans are spending a lot of time in places like crypto conferences and a lot of these podcasts. So, um, you know, there was this really powerful moment at the DNC where D.L. Hughley, who is a really popular Black radio host, actually apologized to Kamala yes. Harris for perpetuating this idea that as California's attorney general, as sort of the top cop in a state, she uh, incarcerated disproportionate numbers of black men. She was part of a system that did that, but she, but he basically made it seem like she herself was like uh, uh, one of the architects of mass incarceration in yeah. California. That was not really true. But, you know, for many of his listeners, I think that caught fire. Now, it was this incredible and like, again, like very significant moment at the DNC for him to apologize and correct the record. But I do recall thinking to myself, aren't you kind of talking to the people who are already going to vote for Harris, who are already probably not that suspicious of her background, or who may hear you and say, well, okay, you know, like, a lot of young black folks, um, young black men and women are not really listening to black radio anymore. Um, I myself as a as a teenager and in college often argued with my parents when they turned on DL Hughley show. I was like, I want to listen to music. I want to stream something. I don't want to hear this. So I think I think that in some ways Democrats were kind of talking past each other um, and not actually reaching the audiences as they needed to. So questions are starting to come in, which is perfect. That's uh, that's right about that. That's, we're ready for that. Um, one of the questions, and it's actually come up like three times already. I'm seeing, is 
okay, so what's the progressive, the winning progressive or liberal agenda that can restore both uh, black mobilization, maybe to the Obama coalition levels and to, uh, you know, protect Democrats wide lead among support um, am among black voters. Did you guys either in, in your, your research or in reporting uh, come across like the the winning message or a winning set of policies that may be able to to stop the the draining of black uh, voters, maybe particularly black men from the the Democratic Party. Uh, and whoever feels uh, uh -huh. well, wants to jump on that one, I can I can start off. I think um, there were several things that I have come across that actually have been consistent really since the nineteen since the nineteen sixties. Uh, the first one is an aggressive economic. Uh, message, an uplifting opportunity message. And so it was actually really quite remarkable. Kamala Harris comes out with her economic opportunity agenda, her Black uh, economic opportunity agenda, but she comes out with that in October. And, you know, the first piece of advice I would have, I would have given is, this is actually something that should have been an integral part of Joe Biden's entire political administration. But there's this real calculation and fear, I think, amongst Democratic or establishment Democrats, which is that we have to be president of everybody. We're a big tent. We can't show favoritism towards, you know, a particular black group. For the for black group, particularly, um, I think black men and black, actually black men and black women, they're looking around and they're saying, but why not? You can do it for everyone else. This is a Certainly. common refrain, right? Mm. Which is have you seen Trump's see administration picks? Like that's right. No, no that problems is, there. <laughs> that that's how politics works. We right. give you votes, you give us something. And I think about, I think it was Patrice Cullors' letter to Joe Biden in the immediate aftermath of uh, his victory, where she's mm -hmm. like, we helped put you in the White House. Now you need to give us something. And, you know, there are lots of things I think that the Biden administration has done that have positively benefited uh, African Americans and Black voters. But that's not what Black voters are also asking for. They are asking for things that explicitly benefit them. And so when we see Harris finally roll this out, it actually is remarkable. It's not perfect, certainly, but it's remarkable because it is. it shows that the campaign has been listening. So why hasn't this happened before? So that's one. The other thing I think is thinking about uh, what are what does transactional politics look like? Right? And Black voters, I think, uh, told people what transactional politics looked like. And the problem is that people didn't necessarily listen. So for Black women, uh, there was a collective kind of push where they were like, we want a Black woman on the Supreme Court. And Biden was like, all right, bet, we got that. Like, we'll, we'll put a Black woman on the Supreme Court and you'll get a Black woman VP. This is, this is the thing that you guys said you want. Now let's do it. For Black men, you hear Black men saying, we want money. Right? It's not just about economic <laughs> opportunity. You guys always roll out job training programs, but it's it, job training programs are irrelevant if there are no jobs. And if there are no, uh, it, it's not just about jobs and employment, but if there's no social mobility in the job. So if I don't have the ability to move up the social ladder and I can't make more money and inflation, you know, it's global. Okay, everybody's being punished, but that doesn't help me when I have to pay my rent and my rent is more than what I get paid on a monthly basis. So, you know, there are all of these kind of, um, you know, human factors that they're talking about with transactional politics and that the Democratic Party just simply doesn't, doesn't address. One of the things that, I, that became very clear about Donald Trump is that he is a transactional president, right? And the thing that stuck out to me, and people made jokes about this, but I think we actually should need to go back and revisit this. Donald Trump put his name on those stimulus checks. Joe Biden did not put his name on those stimulus checks. And one of the things we heard over and over again from a certain like cohort of black male voters in particular is Donald Trump put money in my pocket. And I know he put money in my pocket because I saw his name on the check. Right. <laughs> and we uh, people laughed at it. They were like, that's silly. That's 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 ridiculous. Whatever. That's you know, that's not going to make a difference. But actually, at the margins, it does make a difference. And then the last thing I think is thinking about who are authentic people that can talk to black communities. Because one of the things that black communities have said over and over again, but particular black men is, 
stop sending these people into our communities that are not authentically connected, that are not organically connected, that are out of touch, out of date, right? How are you sending politicians in to talk to 25 year olds and they've never heard of Twitch? They don't know what cryptocurrency is. They don't know who Kai Sanat is or why he matters or why he's important, right? And they dismiss it and they say, these things don't matter. Everything matters. <laughs> these things really, especially in this close election, there is no reason why, you know, especially thinking, I think about, you know, there was a lot of attention that was paid to Charlemagne the God, right, as a political interloper. Okay, that's fine. But why isn't there an equal amount of attention on a figure like Joe Budden, right? And his, or, and his podcast, which has millions of listeners. Why isn't there equal amount on, say, Drink Champs, which also has millions of listeners? Why isn't there an emphasis on who is it Cameron and Mace's podcast I don't know if anybody caught that there was an episode right before the election where Mace Mike Tyson and Cameron all said that they were voting for Donald Trump right it went viral yes. amongst young people <laughs> and people didn't give a damn but those yeah. are the kinds of things at the margins you have to pay attention to and be plugged into if you want to essentially stop the slow trickle especially of black men out of the party I'll just I, add really quickly. Yeah, like, yeah. That was all incredible and like absolutely right. And the only thing I'll add Perfect. to that last point is, you know, build a bench. I think that's one thing that at least Democrats here in Georgia are, are trying to to figure out now is who's next. They're having all these conversations about, you know, whether their leaders have failed them in the state. But then the next part of that question is, who are the people who we think will do better? And have we adequately give have we adequately trained them and given them the tools and the resources to be able to have these conversations? There's plenty of young Democrats who are really exciting here in the South. I think um, the Justins in Tennessee, especially, have been generating quite a lot of attention and have done a lot of really good work in the state and in their communities. Um, they also weren't huge presences on the campaign trail. I'm not sure if that would have made a difference or not, but uh, that's just one example that's been shared with me. So um, on top of having the right messengers, also making sure that the people that you're putting in place to be elected reflect the communities that you want to actually um, appeal to. Yes. Yeah, and that actually leads right into another question that's popped up two or three times already thinking about 2028, but it's really a question of benches. Um, you know, is, is there someone... Donald Trump constitutionally can't run again. We'll, we'll see, you know, how what 2028 looks like if if we get there. Is I wonder, do you guys see um, folks on the bench that might have a shot at at sort of building a coalition that can compete with what what Trump has sort of constructed, governors or senators or even folks at the state level that may arise out of nowhere. Maybe not at the Obama rate of of uh, of rise, but but sort of these diamonds in the rough that have yet to be discovered. But Maya, you mentioned some folks in the South. I heard Warnock a lot from people as they realized Harris's name was going down. Who's, who's your sense of, of who might excite some Black voters that weren't moved this time around? Well, I think Warnock was one of the most important and still is most one of the most important political figures in Georgia, not just because of his landmark wins in 2021 or 2020, 2021 and 2022. So he's very battle tested. But I mean, he also sits at the helm of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Like that mm -hmm. is one of the most iconic churches in Georgia and in the Deep South. He's really been a politician for decades just by ha by virtue of having that that position. Um, John Ossoff, of course, is uh, going to run again in 2026 and has very much, I think, many of his the political moves we've seen him make suggest that he wants to have a long career in democratic politics. Um, Andy Bashir, the governor out of Kentucky, has also been very outspoken about how Democrats can win in really tough maps. And he's um, a red state governor or a, a Democrat who's won in a red state now twice and so feels that he has some knowledge of how to do this. Um, the same is true of Josh Stein, the newly elected Democratic governor in North Carolina. Um, we'll see how he navigates a uh, Republican controlled state legislature um, and how he tries to govern in a state that I believe was Trump plus two. Um, 
but still was able to win uh, as a Democrat mm -hmm. the governor's mansion. So what his strategy is. And I think Democrats just have to do a better job of talking to each other and sharing strategies a lot. Right now, you know, we're, I guess, 10 or 11 days post-election, and it still feels like we're very much in the finger pointing sort of soul searching mm -hmm. stage. Um, but there are people waiting in the wings who are ready to share their insights and who feel like if given the money and the time and the mentorship and whatever else they need, can really um, have a real shot at, at changing the map uh, in favor of their party. Yeah. So one thing I was, uh, one thing I would just, just to add in quickly, um, I think it's about mobilizing and then institutionalizing that mobilization. So Democrats in the past have done a really good job of, of mobilizing. 2020 is an excellent example of that. They've done a poor job historically of institutionalizing those mobilized groups. And so now is the time to actually start mobilizing and institutionalizing. And that means pouring money, I think, into the organizations that have shown a, a, a track record of success, even if they faltered in 2024. So I think one of the things that we should all be looking towards, we should all be looking towards Stacey Abrams. We should right. all be looking in terms of on the ground. We should all mm -hmm. be looking towards uh, Latasha Brown and Black Voters Matter. We should look, be looking towards uh, Black Men Matter, the uh, Black Men Male Voters Matter, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these groups that have done a fantastic job of mobilizing people, thinking about how can we institutionalize them for the long run in, the de uh, in defense of Black communities. The other thing that I would say is that, just to add to Maya's list, I think Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, um, and Gretchen Whitmer, uh, the governor of Michigan, have shown really interesting kind of uh, favorabilities amongst Black voters that are important to pay attention to. Um, and then, of course, the last person that I can think of is Wes Moore. And mm -hmm. part of that is a question around who are Black voters connecting to organically and authentically? And I think Westmore has a story, right? The kind of like community college, uh, kind of uh, working class upbringing, uh, veteran, but very much battle tested, right? The Baltimore kind of, uh, uh, the Baltimore uh, bridge uh, crisis uh, uh, mm -hmm. from earlier this, this year, um, but also the, you know, pardoning uh, offenders, the 75,000 uh, uh, commuted, commuted sentences or pardoned sentences. These are things that I think ha have helped him emerge as a spokesperson very early on in his, uh, in his administration, but may be part of him becoming the future of the Democratic Party. But certainly the leaders of the Democratic Party right now, the people that we traditionally have thought of as, as the faces of the Democratic Party, now it's time for them to actually step to the side and let somebody else lead. Mm. Um, and, uh, amazingly, we're already uh, essentially out of time. Uh, and I, I I could go for another hour because there's so many <laughs> questions I have about, about um, Black voters. But I wonder if you guys could, like, just in a couple of sentences or so, if you both could give me your sort of sense of what will... Oh, what will like the first year of the Trump presidency look like for Black America? Um, you know, I mean, there's there's a protest route that we've sort of seen uh, after George Floyd's murder that sort of reshaped the nation. There's the um, trying to sort of the engagement with party politics or trying to um, work through Congress to sort of challenge policies you don't agree with. I'm just trying to get your sense of do does this election. Um, suggest that Black voters will become more engaged if, or that they'll become more disillusioned. I'm just trying to get your sense of sort of w what the next step might be for, for Black voters outside of the election, sort of in the wake of one. I don't think we know yet. Yeah. I, I, if, yeah. But, if, but if I could make like a general statement, um, it'll be a time for choosing. You know, we'll see mm -hmm. exactly what this White House does, um, how some of Trump's policies impact Black communities and Black livelihoods. Um, and we'll continue to, I'll continue to work with my colleagues doing the reporting. We'll continue to look at the numbers and really see uh, if this means that Black voters come back to the Democratic Party and say, here are our demands and this is how you build a, a stronger coalition with us as an integral part of it. Or and this is, I, I don't think this will happen, but we don't know if a large number of black voters kind of throw their hands up and say, I've done all I can do. This mm. is no longer a group project I want to be a part of. 
Mm. Yeah, and I'll just very quickly say that this is, um, I think the first, the first year is uh, black voters are tired. I think that's across the board. I think it does, it's irrespective of who they voted for. They're exhausted. And this is one of the things I think we heard over and over again, really over the, the last four years, which is we're tired. We ha You haven't given us the space to properly grieve 2020 or right, the moments of the George Floyds and you know the Breonna Taylors. And once again, we've done, you know, we've done our patriotic duty, we've done, done our democratic duty, and now we're really, really tired. And we're tired of people pointing the fingers at us. We're tired of people putting the weight of this when consistently we've done what has been in our best interest. Um, and it's the rest of you guys who need to get it together. But the thing that I will end on, because I like to end on an optimistic note, which is I think this is actually a moment of opportunity that for Black voters, this is the clearest point in time where, where essentially both political parties are crumbling and the possibility of something being reborn with Black voters at the helm is a very distinct and real opportunity moment. So I want us to think about that, especially as we're thinking about what does the future of uh, two-party politics look like? And what does it mean to mobilize and institutionalize for very real and tangible change? Now is the time for Black voters to really look to the Democratic Party and say, you owe us. Now it's time to make good on those, make good in some real tangible ways on those promises. Yes. Very good. We got to stop there. Um, thank you all for, for tuning in. I invite you to New America's website where you can subscribe to the political reform newsletter as well as the, I said, 250 newsletter to stay abreast of what we're up to. But thank you so much to Leah wright Rigur of Johns Hopkins and CNN and my King of New York Times. Please, please continue your work. You guys keep me smart. So I, uh, I always <laughs> look forward to seeing you both. Thank you all for joining us. It's good to be here.